This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. All right, welcome to the third week of the mini medical school here at UCSF, uh, the Medicine of Cycling edition. Uh, my name is Mark Abramson. I'm a co-founder of Medicine of Cycling. I'm also vice chairman of USA Cycling, um, and I run a software company as my, uh, as my day job. Um, my wife, Anna, uh, in the back, is an attending physician um, here at UCSF, um, and obviously we are both uh, very passionate cyclists. Um, we're very excited to bring some of the top talent from our annual medical conference um, that's usually held in Colorado Springs, Colorado, um, back here to the Bay Area um, for, for you, our audience. Um, you can find out more about our organization at medicineofcycling.com. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Jim Taylor. Dr. Jim Taylor, PhD, specializes in the psychology of performance in sport and business. He is an adjunct professor in the sports management graduate program at the University of San Francisco. Um, he's been the team psychologist for the Subaru, Gary Fisher, and Trek VW mountain bike professional teams. He's the author of 14 books, 750 articles, and has given more than 1,000 workshops uh, all around the world. Um, in addition to all of that, he's also a former alpine ski racer two-time Ironman competitor, um, triathlete, and an avid cyclist riding both road and mountain. So without further ado, here's Dr. Jim Taylor. Thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. And I have a great passion for cycling and a great belief in the role of the mind in cycling. And so we have a lot, a lot to cover tonight, so I'm going to get right to it. And I'd like to start off with um, a couple of questions. Uh, first, how important is the mental side of cycling compared to the physical and technical side? And I want to take a little poll here. Uh, raise your hand if you believe the mental side of cycling is less important than the physical and technical side. Good, we have a couple of courageous people willing to raise their hand in front of, in front of a psychologist. Uh, how many of you think it's as important? Raise your hand. Wow. How many think it's more important? Wow, even more. I have to tell you how much I appreciate all you people who say it's more important, but even as a psychologist, I don't believe the mind is more important. But it is an essential piece of the puzzle. The reason I don't think it's a, quite as it's more important is because you can have all the mental stuff in the world, but if you're not physically capable of riding, all the mental stuff doesn't matter. <laughs> but it is an essential piece of the puzzle. It is something that's often, unfortunately, neglected. And what I hope to do for the rest of my time with you this evening is educate you a little bit about the role of the mind, because we all know it's important, but how specifically it's important, I'll explore that. Next question is, should peak performance be your goal? And most people think of peak performance as performing at your highest level, doing the very best you can. Sounds like a pretty good goal. But as I, be as I became more experienced as a psychologist, as a writer, I came to appreciate the power of words. And I decided that peak performance wasn't highly descriptive of what I wanted the athletes I worked with to achieve. And I struggled for a couple years coming up with a phrase that was better. And if you look at peak performance, what's wrong with peak performance? Well, first of all, once you get to the top, there's only one place to go. And the drop is usually precipitous. That's the nature of peak. Also, when this, the, the point of, the, of reaching that peak is very short. And also, you can, meet, you can um, reach your peak a week early or a week after the competition or a big ride you have. So I struggled with it for a couple of years, and I finally um, had a meeting of timing and readiness. I was walking through the, uh, the grocery store through a meat section, and I saw a piece of beef with a sticker on it that said, prime cut. Prime cut. And I had my little aha experience. I w went home to my office and looked up the word prime, and it was defined as of the highest quality or value, of the highest quality or value. So I finally had my thing, what I call prime performance, or in this case, prime cycling. Now here's how I define prime cycling. 
right in at a consistently high level under the most challenging conditions. Right into the most, right in, the highest, uh, consistently high level under the most challenging conditions. Two important words in that definition. Can anybody here figure what those two words are? <laughs> <laughs> of course you can. First, consistency. What makes the great cyclists great is not their ability to go out and have one good ride, one good training ride, or one good stage ride, or one good race. What makes the great ones great is their ability to go out there day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out, year in and year out, and ride at a consistently high level. Second important word there is challenging. Anybody can go out and ride their bike here in the Bay Area, for example, when it's 70 degrees, when it's beautifully sunny, when you're totally on your game. But what makes the great ones great is their ability to go out and ride their best when things aren't good. When you've got one of those marina style headwinds, when you're going up um, the back of, uh, of up, to, up toward Alpine Dam from Fairfax and it's really hard. That's what makes the great ones great. So your goal when you ride, I don't care if you're just a weekend warrior or you guy, or you're some uh, serious competitor. Your goal is to experience prime cycling. <laughs> and the question is, can prime cycling be learned? A lot of people think that that mental stuff you either have it or you don't, and if you don't have it, you can't get it. But what prime cycling is about is about de developing skills, just like you develop technical skills to climb and and uh, descend and so on. Well, you can also develop mental skills in very much the same way. And my goal for you is to leave here tonight with a toolbox. A toolbox filled with mental tools. Now the great thing about a mental toolbox, it doesn't weigh you in any, anything. It's not gonna weigh you down. It's not like carrying us, us tubes or, or wrenches or what have you. It doesn't care, weigh anything. And yet, you can pull it out, pull tools out of that toolbox when you need to. And I'll describe some situations in which you'll need to. And I will be describing to you tonight many, many tools that you can use. So first question is, what race are you competing in if you're competitive cyclists? Well, there are actually three races that you compete in every time you get on your bike in a formal race. The first one is the obvious one, the competitive one against other competitors. But before you can win the competitive race, there's another race you have to win. And I know, and I know what you're thinking, you think of the mental race, right? Not yet. It's the one against the course. That you're, the course is trying to whoop you. The course is trying to crush you to get you to stop and beg for mercy. <laughs> and if you don't win the race against the course, you can't possibly win the race against the competitive field. But before you can win the competitive race, and before you can win the, the race against the course, you must win, yes, the mental race. How many of you have been, been out for a ride, and maybe you're climbing up out of Stinson, or climbing over Marshall Grade, and you start thinking, I can't do this. This stinks, I hate this, what am I doing out here? As soon as that, I see a lot of hands go up. As soon as that happens, Game over. The, the hill, the ride, the course has beaten you. So it's all about staying in, on winning the mental race. Because if you win that, you can win the race against the course, and you can win the race against your competitors if you're in that kind of race. Now, the hard thing about the mental side of sport, the mental side of ski racing, is that it's not tangible. You want to see how strong you are? You get on a, on a stationary bike with a power meter. You can check your heart rate. Technique, you can see yourself on video. A coach can give you feedback on how to descend or how to climb better. But the mental side, we, again, we all know it's important, but it's these ethereal concepts or mental stuff sort of floating around out there or actually more accurately in your head. So what, I, what I've done is I've created what I call the prime cycling framework. And there's six, six mental areas that I believe are most important for you to ride your best. Motivation, confidence, stress, focus, emotions and pain. Actually, I have a little typo there. The, instead of stress, it should be intensity. So those are the six mental areas that you need to overcome, you need to develop tools for to address when you're out riding. Start with motivation. The determination and drive to achieve your goals. And your goal might be to ride a century. Your goal might be to, uh, to do a ride down the coast. It might be to win a race, become a cat one rider, whatever it might be. But that is the foundation that's at the bottom of the pyramid. Why? Because motivation is everything. It's at the foundation of the pyramid because without motivation, nothing else matters. You're not going to get out of bed. You're not going to get on the bike. You're not going to do the work necessary. It is the foundation of all success in cycling and, in fact, in life. Effort versus goals. I often ask people, especially young cyclists um, who are competitive, you know, how many of you have big goals? And all their hands fly up. They want to go to the Olympics. They want to ride in the tour. Then I ask, how many, of you are you, how many of you are doing everything you possibly can to achieve your goals? How many hands do you think go up? Not too many. Now, there's a problem here. If there's a disconnect between effort and goals. Now, there are two options here. You can either lower your goals or raise your effort. 
There's no right answer here. If you don't want to go for the big goals, that's fine. I'm not here to force you to do that. But if you have big goals, you have to look at yourself and say, am I doing the work necessary? Because people, it's easy to dream about wanting to have a great ride, be a great racer, whatever it is. But talk is cheap. You got to put in the time. Third is the grind. This is a concept I came up with a couple of years ago. And it goes like this. No matter how much you love to ride, raise your hand if you love to ride. It's such a rhetorical question. You wouldn't be here if you didn't love to ride. If, no matter how much you love to ride, you get to the point where with all that love, you're on your bike, it's no longer fun. It's a little boring, it's tiring, it hurts. You'd rather be doing something else. When most people experience the grind, what do they do? They give up, they quit, they ease up. They stop for coffee. But for, for cyclists who really have those big goals, and the great cyclists, when they hit the grind, they realize that's when it really starts to matter. That's what's going to make the difference between those who achieve their goals and those who don't. And that's when they push harder. Because again, that's the point they know that makes the difference. So next time you go out for a ride, and, and maybe you're climbing up TAM, and you're getting near the top, and it's kind of hard, and you're tired, and you think, oh yeah, this is that point that guy talked about. This is the grind, and this is when I'm going to keep going, because that's when you make the most deposits in that bank. So what can you do to take action with motivation? First, focus on your long-term goals. It's especially important when you're hurting the most to focus on why you're hurting. Because your body is communicating very powerfully that it wants you to stop. And if your mind says, okay, I'll stop, game over, you're not going to achieve your goals. But if you remember, okay, I'm doing this because I want to ride that century, or I want to qualify for nationals, or win that race, or whatever it is, that does a couple of things. First of all, it draws your focus away from that pain, which eases the pain. Second of all, it produces some powerful emotions, which I'll talk about in a little bit, that inspire you, that help dull the pain. And it focuses you on what you want to do. So first step, focus on those long-term goals. Have a reason for why you're hurting out there. Have a training partner or group. How many of you people like to ride with people? Yeah, people, misery loves company. <laughs> Also, it's just fun to cycle. You can socialize, you can talk as you're working hard. Plus, no matter how hard, in most cases, no matter how hard you ride alone, you're probably gonna ride that much harder with somebody there, whether it's because you're competitive or because you start to support each other. And I can tell you as a guy, when I was um, training for my Ironmans, one of the greatest challenges for me was riding with other people because of course the testosterone kicks in and I wanted to keep up with people who I couldn't keep up with. But you know what? They don't keep, keep results of training days. You win if you stick with your program, if you do what you're supposed to do. And that might be staying within your, your, um, your aerobic range. Um, if you're competitive, uh, identify your greatest competitor. Think about what is he or she doing? Well, you know what? I want to whoop them next time I ride with them. And it might just be a soldier ride, but it can still get a little competitive, right? So think about them and, okay, I need to do a little bit more. I need to do that extra little bit that's going to help me beat whether it's my best friend or the competitor in the upcoming race. Ultimately, though, you got to compete for the right reasons. you got to ride for the right reasons. You have to want it because you want it. How many of you uh, are forced to ride your bike? <laughs> yeah, you do it because you choose to. You, some one person. Hopefully, you do it because you love it. Otherwise, what's the point? And there are tons of benefits to cycling and whatever reason you do it for, as long as you know those reasons and they're good ones. Uh, from, from Fausto Coppi, ride your bike, ride your bike, ride your bike. Pretty simple stuff when it comes to road motivation. Confidence. How strongly you believe in your ability to achieve your goals. How strongly you believe in your ability to achieve your goals. Why is this so important? Because even though it's actually second on the pyramid, it is what I believe the most important mental factor. Because you can have all the ability in the world, let's say to ride at a certain pace or go a certain distance, but if you don't believe in that ability, you're not going to push yourself to maintain that speed because you think you're going to blow or bonk. You don't, you're not going to ride that distance because you think you're going to crash, metaphorically speaking, at mile 80 instead of mile 100. So a big part of what you do as you train, as you ride, is not only developing the physiological capabilities to go the distance, to go the speed, but developing a belief in those abilities. Confidence is a skill, people. Again, like I said earlier, a lot of people think, well, you know, I've never had much confidence. I've gotten negative a lot. That's just sort of the way I'm wired. Not true. 
And I can tell you from, from my own experience, as well as my work with many athletes, confidence is a skill you develop with practice. Confidence challenge. It's easy to stay positive, motivated, and confident when things are going well. What may, my challenge to you is being able to stay positive and motivated and confident when things aren't going well. When you're cramping, when you're hurting, when you get dropped. That is what makes the difference because your mind is already surrendering. If your mind, your body's already surrendering. If your mind surrenders too, it's over. What's remarkable, and there's been some wonderful research about this, that whenever you think there's nothing left, there's always something left. It's wired into us from when we're, when we're um, out in the Serengeti um, hunting game. We, the, cave, not cave, the, the primitive people would have to um, go for, for hours at a time running and walking, chasing their game. But the body learned through evolution, through adaptation, to always keep something in reserve. Because once they got the game, what did they need to do? Kill it. Kill, well, get home. Because the meat is no good unless they can bring it home to feed their family. So that's wired into us. And so anytime you think there's nothing left, there's always something left. But you need to believe that there's something left. Otherwise, you're not going to, going to access that reserve. So what can you do to take action? First of all, the single greatest way to build confidence is through preparation. Every time you go for a ride, you're putting money in the bank. And your goal is to put as much money in that bank as possible. Because for that big ride, that big race, you want to, make, you want to be able to write as big a check as possible. And there's no overdraft protection in cycling. You can't write checks that you can't cover. It's usually funnier than that, but anyway. <laughs> so uh, I think it's very clever, but okay. But so your goal is to be prepared. When you get to the line for, that hundreds, for the century ride or for that big race, what I want you to be able to, be able to say to yourself is, I'm as prepared as I can be to achieve my goals. Because ultimately, that's all you can do. And if you're not fully prepared, I have no sympathy for you. Because you could have been. Mental toolbox. You're driving down the road. You get a flat tire. You pull over. Go to the trunk. No spare, no tire iron, no jack, no AAA. You're stuck. But if you get a flat tire, you pull over, you've got those things. You can fix the tire, get on your way. The same holds true when you're riding and you start to lose confidence. And you're losing confidence because you're in pain, because you're tired, because you're losing focus, because you're having all kinds of weird emotions come up. What you can do if you've got that mental toolbox is pull the tools necessary out to fix the problem. If you know you can fix it, you're going to be a lot more confident. You can get on your way. Self-talk. This is like old school, Norman Vincent Peale, power of positive thinking. But what you say to yourself impacts what you feel and what you do. If you say, I can't do this, I can't make it up this hill, you're right. So you have to be very aware of what you say to yourself. Great exercise. Never, next time you go out for a ride, <clears throat> be aware of what you say to yourself when things get hard. Do you go to the dark side? You probably do. Again, little tool pull out. Oh, yeah, that guy talked about self-talk. I need to bring it on. I need to say, keep at it, keep going. Now, you don't have to say things like, I'm loving this. That's unrealistic. <laughs> but, you, but you can say, I chose to do this. I have my goals I want to achieve. And you know what? I'm going to make it to the top. From Robbie McEwen, I'm not going to say it, but if you journalists want to call me the best sprinter in the world, that's fine with me. <laughs> Mark Cavendish might have a slight uh, difference of opinion on that, but we'll get to him in a little bit. Intensity, the amount of physiological activity you feel before and during races or rides. Why is it so important? We are physical beings. All the mental stuff in the world won't help if you're not physiologically capable of riding the distance at the speed you want. Now, you can think of intensity this way. It's, it's a range from really low intensity, like sleep, to really high intensity, like sheer terror. Somewhere between sleep and terror, you ride your best. And there's no one ideal level. Now, if you're a sprinter, probably ride at very high intensity, because you need the explosiveness, you need the power. If you're riding 100 miles, probably not best to be that amped up. Why? Because you're burning fuel, and you're going to run out of gas. So you want to be pretty relaxed. But everybody has their own place. And your goal then is to figure out what your ideal intensity is, monitor it before a ride in a race. How many of you get nervous before rides and races? Yeah, pretty natural. What are you doing then? You're burning fuel that you need later on. And then adjust your intensity to that more comfortable level. So what can you do to take action? First, very basic thing, most obvious thing that people forget is breathing. When you start to get nervous before a ride or race, our breathing, our breathing system contracts the muscles, and you see literally people going like this. 
choking, that expression, are, we are literally choking to a degree because everything contracts, we're not getting enough oxygen. Simply taking deep breaths. When you're out on a ride, you, you've got a tough climb and you're out of breath and your body's dying, what's the one thing you have control over? Your breathing. So even though you're out of breath, you can still take control of your breathing. It settles you down, it, it enables you to get more oxygen in your system, and you will be able to maintain your level longer. So simply to being conscious of the deep breaths. Shake out your arms uh, periodically. Um, when I was working with one of the uh, pro mountain bike teams a few years back, I was working with a, a Russian rider on the team, and he had this tendency that he would, start to, he would start to get cramps in his hands, arms, and shoulders late in a race. And what he wasn't aware of that when things start, got down to that last half hour or so of a, of a race, he would start gripping his handlebars like he was gonna crush them. And when you grip your handlebars tight, hands get tight, arms get tight, shoulders get tight, shoulders go up, center of gravity goes up, power goes down, he slows down. So getting him simply periodically to do, th do things, shake out his fingers, shake out his arms, swing his arms a little bit, got the, the muscles loosened up, got him to relax, lowered his intensity. Change position. Have you ever been out on a long ride and your body starts to rebel against being in that one position? In, in my second Ironman in Coeur d'Alene, horrible experience, it was 106 degrees in the bike, my body, I tried to stay arrow the last lap of the bike. My body wouldn't. It was rebelling. I couldn't stay in that position, so I had to ride the last half of the ride just up on my handlebars. But a good thing to do when that starts to happen is change position. Get out of your seat. Go to your drops. Go to the center post. Anything to change your body position. Because too long in one position causes your body to rebel and your intensity increases. One of the craziest techniques I ever came up with was, was smiling. I was working with uh, one of these pro cyclists a few years back, and she was having a lousy day of training. Um, she, she, she couldn't keep up. Her coach was yelling at her. She, um, we, we took a, a water break, and she comes up to me and says, Doc, what can I do here? I'm, I'm sucking life here. And my first thought was like, well, I have no idea. And then I thought, something popped in my head, and I said, smile. She said, I don't want to smile. I said, smile. <laughs> She said, look, I'm having a lousy day. I don't want to smile. I said, smile. So she goes like this. And I said, stay like that. <laughs> Within the next two minutes, there was this unbelievable physiological and emotional transformation. All the tension drained out of her body. She became really relaxed. She started feeling better and happier. And she got on her bike. And the rest of her workout was really good. Do you know what my first thought was? Boy, I'm good at what I do. <laughs> no. no, my first thought was, was, whoa, what's up with this? And I went back to my office and did a little research on it and found out two things. First of all, and the, ob the obvious one is we become conditioned to smiling. When we grow, when, as we grow up, what do we learn smiling means? We're happy, life's good. Also, and, and so that, that triggers things in our body and our emotions. Also, there's been some fascinating neurological research that has found that when we smile, when we, everybody go like this. It releases endorphins, our body's natural relaxants. You should try this sometime when you're just angry about something or frustrated. Force yourself to smile. We are fundamentally physiological beings. It's difficult to think and feel in ways that are inconsistent with, with what our body is telling us. And, and going like this, our body is telling us that things seem to be okay. It's hard to think and feel down when our body is up. And also, think, people think you're a little crazy too, which, is, which can be a very good thing on a ride. <laughs> so next time you're out there hurting, Try just forcing yourself to smile. From Paul Sherwin, all of us do well when things are going well. But the thing that distinguishes great cyclists is the ability to do well in times of great stress, urgency, and pressure. Focus. Concentrate on things that help and avoid distractions that hurt performance. So why is it important? First of all, quality training. You cannot engage in quality training if you are not focused the entire time. Especially if, you, if any of you do speed work. Your body doesn't want to work that hard. So as soon as you let it off the hook, it slows down. You have to stay totally focused the entire time when you're doing quality training. Efficiency. If your mind is drifting back and forth between really focused on your riding and not, you are not being as efficient as you can. Because, what you're, because your body, if you're pushing it, is going to only perform at its highest level when you're focused on doing it. So that's shifting back and forth in your focus, distraction, focus, distraction, focus. You are having that same pattern occur in the quality of your riding, in the efficiency of your riding. Lastly, consistent race performance. The great riders, 
they their mind never drifts off except of course okay in the tour they're cruising along in the flats just having a good time that's not that, that that time doesn't matter but i can assure you as soon as the, the hill starts to go like this or like that for that matter after they after they summit i can assure you they are all there like laser beams so what can you do to take action to develop your focus first keywords really powerful tool if you're climbing if you when you're climbing you have a tendency to get negative or you start to um, lose focus have a keyword you can put it on your handlebars that reminds you to do what you need to do it might be breathe it might be calm it might be attack something that reminds you to do the thing you need to do because if you're constantly saying a word to yourself like attack go charge you're focusing on it and you're gonna do it Second are what I call, call the three P's, just a basic way, a basic sort of mnemonic for, um, for staying focused on the key things. The first, and by the way, I've got a, a talk on the 14 P's of performance psychology. There are a lot of P's in, 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 in my field, um, but we'll just talk about three right now. The first is positive, focus on positive things. Second, focus on the process. That is, what do I need to do to ride well? Not what happens if I get beat or what happens if I win, but what do I need to do to perform my best? Third P is present. What do I need to do now? A lot of times we focus on that, that last climb, which we just totally got dropped. There's a saying that you, can, um, uh, you can't change the past, but you can ruin, ruin a perfectly good future worrying about it. <laughs> focus on what do I need to do now? You, can, you change the, can you change the future? Yeah, by focusing on the present. You can ruin a perfectly good future by focusing on the past as well. So. Focus on positive things, on present, and process. If you focus on those things, you're going to stay in the moment on the things you need to ride well. From Mark Cavendish, what do I mean by concentration? I mean focusing totally on the business at hand and commanding yourself to do exactly what you want to do. And I find it fascinating. You watch the tour and, and you see what it, in the sprints in the early stages. Those guys are like laser-guided missiles. There is no room for lock, loss of focus in that last 100 meters of the sprint. And Cavendish has this tremendous ability to focus where he needs to, when he needs to, and to explode when he needs to. Emotions. Emotions are something that I added to the t near the top of the pyramid um, just a few years ago because I, I came to be convinced in my experience in working with athletes that ultimately it's emotions that dictate someone's ability to achieve prime cycling. I define emotions rather terribly, I have to admit. Intense states that arise in response to situations that influence thoughts and behavior. I searched the internet looking for a good, good definition of emotions, couldn't come up with them. That's the best I could do, but we all know what emotions are. Why is it so important? Well, think about the, the most common emotions that you experience on any given ride. Um, there's fear, frustration, um, anger, despair. Not very happy emotions, but there's also excitement, joy, pride, inspiration. And keep in mind here, people, emotions are two sides of the same coin. You can't experience the good ones unless you allow yourself to experience the bad ones. But that's a lot of emotions to experience, and you can emotion, experience these unbelievably intensely for hours at a time. Because one of the most remarkable thing about cycling is it peels the onion away. After a long, hard ride, you are at your purest, good, bad, and ugly. And it can be incredibly painful in some ways, but it's also incredibly therapeutic. And I'm sure, like me, that's a big reason why you guys ride, because it makes you feel good. Uh, emotions are so powerful because, because they, they're, they're such primitive components of who we are, and they affect us psychologically. They, they affect how we think. They affect our physiology for sure. Think about the different physiology between anger and despair. Wow. Can you, can you ride well when you're angry? Yeah, to first, for a little while. Can you ride well when you despair? Definitely not. And then think about your emotional reactions to riding or, or race situations. When you get a flat, what happens? Do you get, do you get f a flat emotionally? Do you get angry? When you start to cramp, when you get dropped. All these situations create emotional reactions. And they're normal emotional reactions. But the question is how we respond to them. Basic rule of mine is whoever loses emotional control first, loses. When you're riding, it is, emotions are one of your greatest challenges and you need to be able to maintain control over them. So what can you do to take action? First of all, recognize your hot button situations. When you're out for a ride and maybe it's an 80 mile ride and you know that usually after 60 miles, 
you start to get tired, you start to get sort of a little emotionally vulnerable. So if something happens, you have this reaction. It might be despair. And how many of you have experienced despair on a ride? Yeah, not a good emotion. Not a good emotion at all. But again, remind yourself that th there's always a little something left if you can tap into it. But recognize those situations and have a plan for, okay, so next time I, uh, I start to despair late in a ride, I'm gonna talk to my training partner and tell him to yell at me. <laughs> or, or, or I'm gonna yell at myself. I'm not gonna allow myself to go to the dark side. Because in that moment, and I had this experience in, the, in my first Ironman ride, uh, basically an Ironman, it starts at 60 to 80 miles of the bike. That's when it really counts. Everything before that, just warm up. Everything after that, hell. And, and, and you, I didn't know about that. My coach didn't tell me about that, my first Ironman. So, so basically from 80 to 112 miles, I was despairing. No, no, to about 105, then I saw the light at the end of the tunnel, and it was a marathon. But it was a whole other story. Um, but in my second one, even when my body started to cramp up and I started to hurt in that bike, on the bike at 106 degrees, I remembered, oh yeah, this is when things start to fall apart, but they do come back. And I was able to keep myself from going over the emotional precipice. Four keys to emotional mastery. You start to experience some bad emotions. This is a great thing for life, by the way. First, uh, step back. You, know, you can't necessarily get off the bike, but you can maybe gear it back a notch, so to step away from the people you're riding with mentally and, and give yourself a little distance. Okay, I'm starting to despair. Why? Because I'm, I'm starting to hurt here. And then let yourself get, help you, get your physiology get some distance. Take some deep breaths, relax your muscles, because you start to get angry or frustrated, you're just going to do, do, do more of the same and it's going to get worse. Third, figure out why you're, you're feeling this emotion. I'm, I'm frustrated because I can't keep up. Um, I'm, I'm angry because this headwind is slowing me off, keeping me off my pace. And then find a solution. And it might not be, I'm, I can keep up with these guys. I'm just going to back it off and I'm going to go after them in the next hill. Or, okay, you know, I can't ride 22 miles an hour into a headwind. I'm going to back off to 18. But then we're going to be turning around and then I can really rip. So step back, get some physiological distance, identify the problem, come up with a solution, then you go back into it. Emotions and nutrition. Again, I learned this in my long rides training for my Ironmans. We are physiological beings again. And what I found was that when I started to feel bad emotions on a long ride, it meant that I was having a nutritional crisis. So the first thing I do when I start to lose an emotional on a bike, I eat something, I drink something. And pretty remarkably, when you do, you re-energize you re the system, and very often those emotions go away. So important in the long rides. From Rudyard Clip Kipling, if you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs, if you can meet triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. Last, pain. How's this for a definition? Sensory and emotional experience of discomfort, distress, and agony. <laughs> How many of you have experienced that in, in your cycling? Of course you have. That's why you do it, by the way, people. <laughs> I mean, realistically, if it wasn't hard, why do it? Why is it important? First of all, a lot of people think pain is a bad thing. It's actually an essential thing. It's what enables us to survive. Back when we were cave people, if we didn't feel pain, we would do things that killed us. And we couldn't pass on our gene. So it has a very important mechanism. It is a very important mechanism to protect our lives. But unfortunately, pain that we experience now is typically not something that's going to kill us during a ride. It protected us from saber-toothed tigers and from rival tribes people, but it doesn't help us push ourselves. So we have to change our perspective on it. And there are two parts to pain. Because a lot of people think, now wait a minute, pain is physical, it's not mental. But the research is very clear that we experience pain through a lens of our mind. How we look at our pain influences how we experience pain. So putting pain in perspective. Uh, a number of years ago, I was out with a group of guys on a 80 mile ride over Marshall Gray and, and it was hard and we get back and we're sitting around pretty, feeling pretty good about ourselves and one of the guys says, man, that was a suffer fest out there. And we all did. Yeah, we definitely was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But um, I, I do a lot of speaking for the Leukemia Society team in training. And uh, I got to be thinking about, is what we're experiencing out there really suffering? I go, you know what, what people with cancer experience, that's suffering. I, I assume it hurts more. I haven't had cancer, but I assume it hurts more than a bike, bike ride um, suffering. Um, they can't turn it off, and they can't control it. Okay, so what we experience is definitely not suffering. 
How about pain? Well, you know what? I, I've had some some serious injuries in my day, and um, pain. You know, what I experience on a bike is not nearly as bad as what I experience with a serious injury. Uh, again, more severe injury is an injury, and you can't just turn it off. Okay, so it's not it's not pain even. Whoa, we're losing some drama here, people. Um, and uh, so you know what it really is? It's physical discomfort. Physical discomfort because it's not that that bad, and we can turn it off any time we want. We just get off the bike. But you know, we need our sense of heroicism, however diluted it is, and to say that was a physical discomfort fest <laughs> just doesn't work, does it? But I have a hard time using suffering because that's disrespectful of the people who really suffer. But you know what? Four-letter word, pain, let's call it that, but let's keep it in perspective and know what it really is. Also, how we interpret pain. First of all, pain is normal. It's a part of what we do as cyclists. It's also, as I indicated, why we do it. It means we're working hard. And I truly believe that if cycling wasn't hard, we wouldn't do it. Because the pain tells us that we're pushing ourselves, we're challenging ourselves, we're exposing ourselves to things about ourselves that we didn't know about. So pain is actually something that we seek out every time we choose to get on our bike. But it doesn't feel good. So what do we do about it? First, relax. Research is very clear that when, that when, our when we're in pain, our body perceives the situation as a threat. And so what does it do? It circles the wagons. It goes to protect ourselves. So, so we, we go like this to protect ourselves. Unfortunately, it creates more pain. So taking deep breaths, relaxing our muscles, reduces the pain. Using the pain as information. Fascinating research uh, on marathoners found that inexperienced marath marathoners tended, tended to dissociate from their pain. They would distract themselves. But elite marathoners, they associated with it. They paid attention to it because it gave them valuable information about their pace, about their body position, about their stride. So use the pain as information. Maybe I have too, long, too big a gear. Maybe I need to change my body position. Then generate positive thoughts and emotions. Some fascinating research that looked at this found that when people connect pain with negative thoughts and negative emotions, they experienced more pain. Now, unfortunately, the golden days of scientific research is over where you can actually make somebody suffer. Um, <laughs> You remember the old shock? Anyway, yeah. Um, and uh, these days, the way they invoke pain that can't be harmful is have people put their hands in really cold water. That's not that heroic there, but it does seem to work. So the, the point is, is that next time you start to be, feel pain on your bike, create some positive thoughts and positive emotions. The research shows that when you connect positive emotions and positive thoughts, you feel less pain. Doesn't make it go away, but you feel less pain. So you're riding up that hill. She'd be saying things like, oh, I'm loving this. This is great. This is such a fun time. That's not realistic. But you can say, I'm working hard. I'm achieving my goals. This is why I'm out here. How about some positive emotions? You know, that's a tough one. Um, I struggle for a while trying to come up with some emotion, some positive emotion. Joy? Definitely not. Excitement? Uh-uh. <laughs> Serenity? Definitely not the case. I did come up with two. Inspiration and pride. Because when you're hurting out there, that's where that heroicism comes from. It's inspiring to push yourself to new limits. And that gives you great pride. And so those are two emotions in the worst possible emotional time when you're riding your bike, you both on your bike, you can generate. From Scott Martin, all cycling's, at cycling's core lies pain. It doesn't matter if you're sprinting for an Olympic medal, a town sign, a trailhead, or the rest stop with the homemade brownie. And you know what's in those in San Francisco. If you never conf confront pain, you're missing the essence of the sport. So to wrap things up, what's the payoff? Increased motivation, deep and resilient confidence, a relaxed state of intensity, the ability to focus for long periods of time, positive emotions and the ability to handle negative emotions, and then the ability to best master your pain, which of course brings you back to prime cycling, performing at a consistently high level under the most challenging conditions. And if you can experience prime cycling, you, ex you will experience some version of this. Thank you very much. So I believe we have a few minutes for questions. So open up. Yes, sir.
Okay, so with new technology, the use of GPSs and heart rate monitors and power monitors and Strava, how does that affect training? Um, in many ways, it can, it's a valuable tool. Those are powerful tools because they, are, uh, they provide great information for you. And the more information you have, that's tools in your mental toolbox that you can use to ride better. I think Strava is great motivationally because if you put your ride up that you just did on on the um, up up on on, this, on the web, and then you see somebody else just beat you by two minutes, well, that might motivate you to get out there and push you even more. Um, well, I think what you have to be careful about though is that with all this technology, you can lose touch with with your own internal monitoring systems. And um, for for a long time, I was addicted to my heart rate monitor, and if I started to go a little too high, I'd go, oh my gosh, I got to back off. And then I was out with a friend who didn't use one. He said, look, turn it off. And I haven't used it since because I've been riding enough that I know how my body works and I know when I'm starting to hurt and I, when I know when I need to back off. So I think there's a balance there because I think ultimately you can't be totally wired when you're racing or necessarily going out for a long ride. And part of the experience is learning to, to, to experience and monitor and, and evaluate and, and then adjust what the messages your body's sending you. Other questions? Yeah, yeah. I mean, masochism doesn't carry a really wonderful connotations, um, but, uh, but certainly we all do what we do. Anybody who pushes themselves to the limits has a degree of masochism in them, um, uh, but I don't think it's necessarily pleasure in the pain, and this is where we might make a distinction. It's pleasure in what the pain brings you in terms of satisfaction, meaning, joy, uh, again, finding new challenges, etc. A couple things. First of all, there's been some fascinating research that has found that aging in and of itself, that is physical des deterioration, can't adequately explain the decline that most people make in, in the, the, the years over, over, um, over an athletic endurance sport life. Now, when you get to a certain age, and I'm not going to give numbers at this point, there's, there is an inevitable drop, but they found that, that um, if athletes maintain the same level of training, volume, and intensity, they can maintain their times mm -hmm. very closely up, um, up into their 60s. And the reason why most people slow down when they get older is because their, um, their motivations change. For example, in my 30s and early 40s, I, uh, I was single and I had plenty of time to train, so that's all I did. But then I got married and had kids and now I get out for an hour and a half for a ride on weekends. So of course I'm not gonna be in as good a shape because I don't put in the mileage. So that, that's one thing. Second of all, you have to change your, your point of reference. You know, when you're in your 30s, you compare yourself to the very best guys in the field. Then when you get into your 40s, you start looking at guys maybe in, the, in their 30s and see how you stack up against them. Then maybe you get a little higher and then you look at where you are in your age group. And then you maybe get a little farther along and then you say like, I'm happy where I'm at, I'm just enjoying being out here. Because ultimately, especially in endurance sports like cycling, no matter what you do, no matter how good you are, unless you're the very best, somebody's always gonna be faster than you. Of course, there's always gonna be people slower than you and you hope you pass them and they pass you in some sort of balance. But ultimately, that stuff doesn't matter. Nobody cares when somebody zooms by you. They're not thinking, oh, what a loser. They don't, you know what? They don't think about you at all. <laughs> and so, you're, so there's no reason to feel bad, like, oh, that guy's flying by me. You know, they don't care. Oh, the only person who cares about how you ride is you. And if you can just stay focused on, I'm out here having a great time, I'm staying fit, I'm loving life, victory, for sure. Okay, final couple of points. Um, my website, I've, about 95% I've written um, is on there. Tons of newspapers, articles. Um, I also have a blog with a whole section on cycling. I write for um, Pez Cycling News every couple of months. Um, go to the website, tons of stuff there. Um, if you have any individual questions or comments, feel, feel free to email me. I, I, I appreciate when anybody is, emails me, so I'm happy to respond for sure. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. I've enjoyed it.